My plan is sound, mathematically sound. It cannot fail. It's perfect. Three months from now, I will be worth $50,000. Independent for life. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and <clears throat> it's Good Neighbor Day, and of course, the guest today is going to get all of Joe's attention. He's bringing charts, graphs, and maybe an opinion on what you could do to help your career and your lifestyle. On my special day, we welcome a very special guest, the professor himself, Scott Galloway. In our headlines, interest rates are on the rise again last week, so what do we do with that information? We'll share. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to John, who wants to talk about treasuries versus CDs. And then I'll share some neighborly trivia. And now, two guys who don't deserve a neighbor like me. Oh, all right, they do, and so do you. It's Joe and oh, j j j j g Happy Wednesday, stackers, and a happy Wednesday to you, Doug. And you're right, it is Good Neighbor Day, and thank you so much. Let me thank you personally for doing an introduction again for us. It's very nice of you to begin a day like today with a treat such as that. Why why do you sound disingenuous and sarcastic? I'm not not disingenuous. It is just being able to work with you guys here in the basement. It's nice. And I like the reminder that we should be nice to each other. And the guy who's nice to us every single day because he shows. (laughs) I almost got through that without laughing. (laughs) Me too. too. It's, it's, It's Mr. OG. Hey, he's here. He's here. How are you, dude? Nice is my middle name. I don't... <laughs> Sometimes being factual and honest with oneself and one's friends is the nicest thing. It is. Honesty I don't put is... Any, you know... Honesty is the best policy. And today we're... I was a good listener, Doug, when you were struggling with golf this whole year. I mean, it was... He brings up golf was, every was, single time, Doug. Know, that's what he has on me. Every single time. He uh, there's, brings up there's more than that. It's just that's the only thing that I can say on the <laughs> internet. Appropriate for podcasting. We got a great show today. We're not only appropriate for podcasting, we're bringing it because, Doug, as you mentioned, we got uh, Professor Scott Galloway. Uh, Stern School of Business at NYU is uh, how a few people know him. Most of us know him as a guy who started many companies and tends to have an opinion about uh, what you should do with your life, where you should go. He's got uh, statistics and stuff, as we as we say, using the technical term. Uh, say that's a, that sounds like a, a course description at NYU. <laughs> statistics and Stati- stuff and stuff. Yes, and stuff. Big show, big 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 show today. So sit back and relax because we're gonna bring you some good stuff here for about the next hour. Professor Scott Galloway is here. He's waiting in the wings. But first, we have a headline. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. Our headline today comes to us from The Wall Street Journal. It's pieces written by Nick Timoras. The Federal Reserve last week, OG, Federal Reserve, well, it doesn't say that in the headline. OG, it says, <laughs> <laughs> wow, this newspaper specific. I think that's just how he sees the world, though. He just inserts <laughs> his own name into every, like, everybody's just talking directly to him. Wouldn't that be great if Nick wrote that in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal? That would be cool. Fed raises interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point, 0.75 for third straight meeting. On Monday, OG, we addressed this briefly talking about bonds and about uh, Jeffrey Gundelach, the big uh, money manager, the big bond dude, talking about how the Fed might need a water break after all of this drinking. The Fed's not, the Fed's not taking any type of a break now. They're doing not one, not two, but three shots all at once in central banks around the world did the same thing. What's what's going on here? Why does this happen for people wondering? And they're forecasting more to come in uh, the next two meetings, I think. Like another, uh, another two of these. Yeah, for people wondering what this is all about, why does the Fed raise interest rates? Let's start there for the newbies among us. 
Yeah, sure. So the money supply is controlled by how easy it is to get money. And what I mean by that is if you're a business or if you're an individual and you're trying to do things, right? Like build a factory or buy a house, or if money is really inexpensive, buy a car that you shouldn't be able to afford or a vacation house or something like that. You can do it because interest rates are really low. If you had to go buy your house and it's $500,000 and you had to pay for it all in cash, it would take a while to save that money. And so banks came up with this idea a long time ago of saying, well, we'll just give you the money up front, but you have to pay it over time. Well, that over time number gives the bank some money. They have to charge you some interest for letting you borrow their money for a period of time. And your ability to pay that $500,000 isn't necessarily now tied to, can you afford $500,000? It's, can you afford the $2,000 payment? And so when interest rates change and interest rates go up, then the bank is charging you more for that $500,000. So now that payment isn't 2000 anymore, it's 2500 or it's 3000 And so by nature, you're going to be constricting other areas of your life because that $3,000 payment instead of the $2,000 payment, you don't make another $1,000 just because you know, your interest rate is higher on your, on your debt service. So now multiply that by from you times every other person in the economy, and you can see how that will slow down the rate of other spending because it's harder to get money. It's harder to borrow money. And since it slows down the rate of other spending, it's going to slow down the demand for other goods and services, and hopefully that affects the inflation issue. I love the way you explain that, OG, because Thank as, you. People, as, as, <laughs> people, as people think through that, it is Good Neighbor Day. <laughs> as people think through that, you think about, OG, how that assumes we are a debtor nation, right? If you can slow down the entire economy by changing the payment plan and people's ability to repay debt, the Fed assumes that we're all in debt. Which means the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do for yourself financially is to get out of debt. Yeah. I mean, obviously, from a personal standpoint, not owing anybody money is a really great thing. And it's interesting now because let's take the house situation for a second. A lot of people refinance. They've got low mortgage interest rates, right? 2%, 2.5%, 3% compared to today's rate, if you're trying to get one, 55 or 6 maybe even. So the question is, is do you still aggressively pay off that debt? Because now your savings account is getting close to the same rate the you're rate paying on your mortgage. That your mortgage is. And that's pretty risk free, the savings account. I mean, it's almost as risk free as you can get. Certainly, treasuries are even higher than that. So it's an interesting thing. I still think that from a personal standpoint, you want to be as debt free as possible. But you look at the business side of it, and on the business side of the equation, companies grow by borrowing money to expand operations. Not a lot of companies grow really quickly, just free cash flowing the whole thing. And, you know, people are concerned about the debt of the economy and that sort of thing. But all of that debt is financing other productivity. It's just right now, there's too many, too much money that's in the system. I mean, it's mostly from all of the COVID stuff, right? You can see, we can chart that. We can see where all of a sudden there was an excess $2 trillion in the economy. Then it got used to just buy stuff. Nobody really saved the money. It just, there's $2 trillion extra dollars, and I'm going to go spend it. And then that drove up all the prices of everything. You see that across the board on, I mean, we're still having issues with um, chips and, you know, that sort of stuff and car manufacturers and whatnot. So, this is the penance that you have to pay. Second thing, if you can't get out of debt, I think obviously when the Fed, uh, well, maybe it's not obvious, but when the Fed raises interest rates, try to lock down the interest rate you have now, have as little variable rate debt as possible because the Fed already is telling us, yeah. OG, that they're, they're going to raise them again. Like if you're on a they're ready to do it again, yeah, if you're on a variable rate machine, you're you're riding this roller coaster along with the economy and you don't want to be a part of that if possible. Well, the biggest area here is around consumer debt and credit card debt, right? Your mortgage, that's going to be fixed at whatever, you know, or probably is fixed. Your your car payment is probably fixed at whatever it was when you got it. But your credit card debt, your consumer debt is the one that's going to increase. And it's, and by the way, they're not increasing those rates at 0.75%. No, no. <laughs> you know? no there's there, the, the bank goes, well, they... You know, because this all rolls downhill, it's right? So, yeah. so where does you know when they say they're raising the rate? Who who are they raising it on? 
the Federal Reserve raises it on JP Morgan. That's who gets the raise. Well, JP Morgan doesn't sit there and take it. They go, <laughs> now it's on you guys. Right? And they don't they just don't... pass on the 0.75 because they got to make money on that. Yeah, they pass 75. on 1.25. Right. Yeah, they, they have a little margin. So when you hear that the Federal Reserve raised rates again, they didn't raise them on you. They raised them on all the big banks and money institutions. But the thing that you can control is on consumer debt. And what's really interesting, of course, is that the inflation issue is hitting people in their pocketbooks on goods and services that they need day to day, like food and energy. And where's the go-to if you don't have enough cash? You put it on your charge card. And now interest rates are higher. So now you're going to pay higher interest payments and monthly payments. And now that's going to affect your cash flow. And meanwhile, inflation is still there. It doesn't magically get fixed in one afternoon. And so now you have less money for your sustainable goods and services. And where do you put the money? You put it on your charge card because you don't have, you know what I mean? So this can get, this can snowball pretty quickly out of hand. And if you see that coming, this is a great time to just double check your budget and that sort of thing. If you see that coming, you have to do whatever is possible to get back to even because interest rates are not going to go down anytime soon. In fact, they're likely to go up from here. And I love how they tell us that ahead of time, right? I mean, they, they tell you what they're thinking. It's not a secret. And I think overall what this means to people, if we're going to put a point on this, OG, I think it's companies, and we talk about JP Morgan passing on these interest rates, they have a debt strategy. They have a whole strategy around what happens when we owe more money. Here's what we do. We pass it on to these other, these other people, right? We've got a way, if I'm a CFO of a company, I know exactly what I'm doing with my debt. If I'm the average person out there, I just have debt. I don't really have a debt strategy. Getting a debt strategy, so important, especially when the interest rate magnification of whatever you're trying to do is so much bigger. Have you seen those people online talking about the difference between that 2.75% interest rate some people are paying versus a 6% now, like how much house you can, you can afford? Yeah. Like the difference is yep. astounding how much more house you can afford at 2.75 than you can at 6%. Get yourself a debt strategy. Yeah, but the big issue with that, you know, that's that's a whole nother sector, which is, you know, how is that going to affect housing prices moving forward? And I, you know, you can look at that. But in terms of cash flow, that's an immediate change. You don't immediate, have to go buy yeah. a new house today. No, good point. You, you know, American Express or Visa, they're sending you a note in your statement. They don't even like send you a, they don't even blast it to you. It just is included in your statement. By the way, the new rate is this, <laughs> you know, it's not even like a headline article. It's just it, you know, pay us more. And it's really not even that you're paying more because it's more of your payment is going to go to interest, which means you're going to have less of an impact on your, on your principal balance. Move heaven and earth to get those consumer debts paid off quickly. The variable rates. If you're looking for tactics to do that, we have a newsletter called The 201 where we dive into these much more in detail. Uh, so if you are looking for a deeper dive, stackybenjamins.com slash 201. Our newsletter comes out twice a week, always free. And I love all the great comments we get about The 201 and our ability to, you know, talk about the issue here. And if you want more on these topics, whether you were able to catch this episode or not, you can get the deep dive on the 201. Coming up next, Scott Galloway. I can't believe I'm saying that name. Uh, professor of Marketing at NYU Stern School of Business. I'm not sure that's how people know him here. If you've never heard Scott Galloway talk, you uh, should buckle your seatbelts because this gentleman might have an opinion or two about where we should head next. We're going to ask him not just about what he talks about, which is his new book called Adrift, where he talks about all the different things going on in the economy, in the work world. And we've talked a lot here, OG, about the pay gap and about women making sure that they advocate for themselves. We have Bola Sucumbi on talking about that. He talks about a lot of the problems young men face. And there's some serious problems that young men face right now. So I'm sure he'll bring that to the table as well. He is... In 2012, named one of the world's best business professors by Poets and Quants. I couldn't imagine being in his class. He's slightly intense, and I'm so glad that we, that we have him here. You know another guy I'm glad we have here on Good Neighbor Day? It's, it's Doug. 
Yes. Oh, gee, oh, point you're the serious. other oh, way. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. And I know you're going to honor us again with some trivia, aren't you? Just sorry. I'm just a little nauseous, but I'll pull it together. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and happy Good Neighbor Day. Though, can't say I have good neighbors. You know, I thoughtfully made Joe's mom breakfast. I put it on a tray, served it to her in bed. Uh, didn't even spill it while I was climbing through the windows. Uh, and, and, and she, I mean, she was kind of cool. She told the police officer she wasn't going to press charges. But I mean, still, I've always been a good neighbor. I sort their mail for them. I throw anything away that looks useless or stressful. I brought over my goats to help them trim back their hedges. I had high-intensity lights installed outside my place to make sure their property's never dark and dangerous. I mean, you could even say they were lucky. Well, I guess so am I. Most people don't even know their neighbors, but you should, especially if you're looking for a job. Networking is incredibly important. So here's my question. What percentage of job opportunities come from knowing someone? Is it more or less than 75%? I'll be back with the answer right after I get done poking a bunch of holes in Joe's mom's hose to make her a sprinkler. Hey there, stackers. I'm poor man's Mr. Rogers, and reason at least two no trespassing signs were sold last weekend, Joe's mom's neighbor Doug. You might think the best way to look for a job is to scour the web, but you'd be wrong. More than half of jobs come from personal connections. Although, in my case, that's why I haven't gotten 100% of the jobs where I've known someone. According to a U.S. Bureau of Labor and Yale University study, you're better off trying to get to know your neighbors, or anyone else for that matter. So, what percentage of jobs comes from networking? Is it more than 75%? Nearly, and still a big number, it's 70%. Now, to help you attract more opportunities, we welcome Professor Scott Galloway. Professor Scott Galloway joins us. How are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm a bit jet lagged. I just got into London this morning and I'm trying to you know, get through the day so I can fall asleep tonight. That is, well... If anything, hopefully we'll keep you awake. I hope it's the next 20 minutes. Let's do let's do our best. By the way, before we start in on this project, Scott, I have to tell you that uh, you don't know this. You and I share the same love, and I say love with air quotes, for a certain brokerage account that I've seen you go off on, a brokerage company that uh, maybe misnamed, steals from the poor to give to the rich, aka themselves. Yeah. Uh, say more. Uh, Robin Hood specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I you know. I, I guess the company. You're you're not a fan. I am not a fan. In fact, it's funny. We've had fans of our show that have said, uh, "Why do you come down on Robin Hood so much?" I'm like, this company does something that should be very basic, and I feel like the fact that they continually uh, have oops moments drives me crazy. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's really unfortunate. It kind of ties into one of my big themes in the book is failing young men. of gambling addicts are male. Also, gambling addiction has the highest suicide rate because you can get in really deep and nobody knows. And then you feel as if there's no way out. If you have a meth problem, people figure it out and usually intervene. And gambling, you can lose your house, your kid's college fund, bust all your life insurance, and nobody knows. It's a very mendacious addiction. And I feel that Robin Hood... I was in the business of figuring out a way to create a business model that incentivized them to addict young people to gambling. When you're trading options in crypto, which is about 60, 70% of their revenue, that's not investing, that's gambling. And there are kind of dark psychological techniques around random rewards and visual stimulation. We're just there simply to addict young men in a period where I think a lot of young men were bored had some money from stimulus checks, and it's also a really business. They've actually lost accounts. Their average size dollar value of their accounts is $260. Uh, the stock's off 90%, which means it went down 80% and then got cut in half again, and I think it could go down another 90%. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't like the company. I think the founders represent kind of what's horrible about Silicon Valley, a group of young men who conflate luck with talent and don't really feel any sort of fidelity or loyalty to the Commonwealth or, you know, other Americans. So you and I are brothers from another mother on this issue. (laughs) 
when I heard you rail against that, I think that was first Scott when I fell in love with you. I think that was it. Thanks but for like, that. Well, let's, <laughs> that was the but, moment. But <laughs> there was a magic moment. They were playing our song. There you go. The genesis of this project in particular in these 100 charts, tell me about just the making of. How did you uh, get this idea? We've had an alphabet for 1,500 years. We've had the computer for 50 years. But we've had images. Uh, we've been trying to interpret and communicate with images for thousands, tens of thousands of years, whether it's paintings on the side of a cave wall or making plans based on the height of the sun in the sky. So as a result, we can absorb or process or understand images six to 60 times faster than words. And I've always just been fascinated with charts and a basic kind of dictum across our company has always been, can we say this with a graph or a chart? Uh, I thought when you're sort of trying to tell the story of America in terms of what ails us economically, what are some of the opportunities, what are some of the solutions, I thought it easiest to do it through charts. Now, the way the book's set up, it has a chart on the left-hand side, on the, right, on the left window, and then on the right pane, it has a narrative. But it's meant to build a story, starting with how did we get here, recognizing the unbelievable achievements of America, talking about the middle class as a ballast for any society and what's happened to our middle class, talking about our innovators, talking about failing young men, talking about higher ed, and then talking about uh, some proposed solutions. But yeah, try to do it with charts. I want to ask you questions on just a few of these topics. You begin the book talking about shareholder value. And this rise in the 60s and 70s in shareholder value, where did this narrative begin and and how did it catch on so much where it's really, to your point, all most boards think about these days? Yeah, I don't know if it was Milton Freeman or the era of Jack Welch or the fact that shareholder returns were really poor during the 60s and 70s, but basically capital sort of bound together and said, we deserve more. And management isn't taking capital or investors seriously, and they got more organized. And also, this notion from Milton Friedman that shareholder value is, you know, I think something along with any CEO focuses on anything other than shareholder value is doing a disservice to the country. It was something like that. And it was a very easy, romantic vision to kind of follow. And it was also the people who were mostly responsible for deciding whether that would be their North Star became tremendously incented to do everything optimized for shareholder value. Uh, boards of directors, who usually represent shareholders, not the workers. In Germany, half the board uh, is represented by usually the biggest union in, that works at the company. In the U.S., essentially, directors represent shareholders for the most part. They talk about, they now use the word stakeholders, not shareholders, but for the last 50 years, it's been all about the share price. And then typically management, who decides what they're going to pay people, where they're going to invest, the majority of their compensation comes from shares or the share price. So everything began getting optimized for the price of the shares in about the early 70s. And there was this great uncoupling, if you will, and that is up until that point, wages and productivity in America were sort of inextricably linked. They look like two snakes dancing with each other, intertwined. You know, if productivity went up 3%, wages went up 2.7%. Everyone sort of shared in the prosperity. And then in 1970, wages went flat for 50 years and productivity kept skyrocketing. And the delta between those two is literally trillions of dollars, if not tens of trillions of dollars in excess value that was captured all by shareholders. Because when you're totally optimized for shareholder value, you're much more inclined to buy shares back rather than invest in plant property and equipment or new employees. You're much more likely to fight any sort of minimum wage. You're much more likely to fight any union. You're much more likely to pay people less or have software that clocks them out automatically when your North Star is just shareholder value. It used to be a lot of things 100 years ago, not just that. And there's even a website on it uh, that just talks about nothing but what happened in the early 70s when all of a sudden we decided to make shareholders king, or actually you'd say the consumer's king, shareholders are the prince, and workers are the pauper. I want to dive into that a little bit more because you have two charts in that first chapter, which uh, I think make this point very well. Uh, during the time frame you have in the chart, worker productivity up 120%, wages are stagnant, what you talked about. At the end of your book, you bring up some really big ideas about what we need to do, Scott, as society. But if I'm somebody who's just worried about what Stephen Covey said, you know, my mm -hmm. realm of direct control, mm -hmm. if I'm a young person 
And I know that there's this huge income inequality gap between the top 1% and the bottom 99%. Things are getting better. Like, what do I do with this? How do I take this and then begin to form a career that makes sense? Well, so there's kind of your larger concerns around the Commonwealth, and I would say at the end of the day, it's a vote. Uh, half the people in America are under the age of 38, but only 5% of our elected officials are under the age of 38. The two states we hold the first presidential primaries, which kind of largely dictates who's going to be president, are all two of the oldest states in the union. They're Iowa and Maine. So as a result, our elected representatives and our president uh, do a great job of representing older people, not younger people. So we've affected a transfer of wealth from young to old, that's just unprecedented. The percentage of GDP that people under the age of 40 uh, register their wealth used to be 19% of GDP. Now it's nine. Meanwhile, the average person over the age of 75 has seen their wealth increase 72%. It's down, I think, 24% for people under the age of 40. So look at the two largest tax deductions, mortgage interest rate and capital gains, who owns home and owns stocks, old people who rents and makes all of their money from sweat and current income, young people. There's this, what I call this illusion of complexity or the world is what it is ism. And that is people throw up their arms and say, you know, these forces are bigger than us. No, no, these are, these are deliberate decisions we made to transfer money from young people to old people and to transfer money from workers to shareholders. These are deliberate decisions. That's the bad news. The good news is we can absolutely unwind them. So you asked me, what should a young person do? One, I think young people should be focused on developing their own economic security. I think they should be very focused on it. I think in a capitalist society, America becomes more like itself every day, and that is it's a loving, generous place for people who have economic security. It's a rapacious, unkind place for people who don't have economic security. So I think you should be focused on, one, getting to a city. I think that being in a city is like playing tennis constantly against someone who's better than you. Your, your game elevates. You're around the best and brightest. And you'll have the most contacts and opportunities for selecting a mate, selecting a job, selecting interesting things to do, people to do it with. Uh, to get certified, I don't know if it's a you know scuba certification or class three driver's license or uh, certification in you know repairing a certain type of electric motor or a college degree. We live in a LinkedIn economy. You need to be certified. Try and live like a stoic when you're young. Try and save some money. I mean, it's just such it's so passe, but it's so true. If you can save a thousand bucks a month from the age of 22 to 40, you're kind of done. You're you're going to end up at 60 with economic security, uh, as opposed to what I did. I really didn't start saving money till 35 because I thought it was such a baller that at some point it would rain money. <laughs> that was and me. Sorry, that was me too. That was totally I think that's me. Most of us. So it's kind of do as I say, not as I do. I realize it takes discipline, but you know, I've made a lot of money over the last. 15 years. I got very lucky with some of the business I sold. I have a friend who's never really made a lot of money, but he's always like from day one been talking about 401ks and putting money away. And he's, he's got as much money as I do. And it's because he's just been smarter about it, more disciplined. I had a few more fun weekends in Ensenada and at Mammoth Mountain, you know, weekend trips with my UCLA buddies, but he was just smarter, more disciplined about it. Force yourself to try and be around strangers every day. And I think this is especially important in an era of COVID where we're more distanced from each other, we're more uh, remote and isolated from each other. Try and put some structure around yourself such that every day you're around strangers in the agency of something else, the agency of work, the agency of government service, nonprofit service, the agency of God, whatever it might be, the agency of sports, but just try and be around strangers every day because the most important decision you'll make is who you partner with the rest of your life, Mm -hmm. specifically who you have kids with. And the quality and fit of that decision will be a function of how many people you bump off of. And I worry, especially with young men, 32% of them are single under the age of 30. It's 51% for women. So 50% more women than men have some sort of a romantic partner. And I think young men uh, need it more. I think they need guardrails. I think they need motivation. I think they need to learn how to read a room. I think they need structure more. Uh, so anyway, a long-winded way of saying, get certified, get to a city, yeah. try and put yourself in a position, whether it's an office or something else, such that every day you're meeting new and different people, try and live below your means. And I always say your, your goal isn't to find your passion, it's to find your talent. And then once you identify something you're really good at naturally, to invest the thousands of hours of becoming great at it. And once you're great at it, you'll be able to command Currency in the marketplace, the result in margin will just make your life a lot easier. But I'm, I'm pretty kind of tasks one and two are 
put yourself on a path to economic security, and two, try and put yourself in a position where you have a lot of opportunities to meet potential mates. I think the elemental foundation of any society is relationships. And the friends I have that are happiest aren't the ones that are most successful. That is important. But uh, the ones who have the best partnerships. Uh, so I, I think those two things are kind of kind of the focus. Talking about getting certified, I saw you recently on TikTok. By the way, great to have somebody, Scott, that's not dancing on TikTok. Congratulations on yeah. avoiding that. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> but, yeah, nobody but, needs to see me dance. That's <laughs> that's not a good look. <laughs> me neither. But you do say, and this is using Joe words, not uh, not Professor Galloway words, uh, we need to take some of the stank off the trades in the United States. And I found those certifications to be interesting. Tell me about that path and why we need that path more. And is that an easier path or is, is that a different path that just is closed because it's not, quote, cool? Yeah. So 50% of Germans have some sort of vocational certification. It's less than 10% in America. And we have sort of fetishized the traditional liberal arts, Bachelor of Arts degree from a college. And parents have been told, to a certain extent, you've failed if your kid doesn't end up at Brown and then at MIT or KKR. Like, you just don't hear parents bragging, yeah, our kid didn't go to college, but he's making 120 grand a year as a plumber. That's just not cocktail banter. We've become very much a lottery ticket, winner-take-all society where your job isn't to be a solid citizen in the middle class. It's to swing as hard as you can to try and be a billionaire or get beamed in the face trying. We fetishize elite colleges. Two-thirds of kids do not end up with a traditional college degree. And the Main Street economy has more jobs than we can fill. Uh, If you can show up to a construction site in Florida right now, and if you're just handy, you can make 20 to 25 bucks an hour. If you have any sort of skills or training, you can probably make 30 to 40 bucks an hour. And I believe our higher education universities need to have their tax exempt status revoked if they don't grow their freshman classes faster than population growth. And I also think the opportunity for that $600 billion to $1 trillion we spent on student debt relief would have been to enter into a grand bargain with our public universities, which educate two of the three kids in our nation, and said, look, we're going to pay for it, but we want you to, one, expand your freshman classes to lower costs, and three, come up with a series of non-traditional vocational certifications, a two-year certificate in cybersecurity that focuses on math and technology. There's a line out the door of employers that would hire those people at six figures, especially construction. Yeah. We're, going to, we're going to be building nuclear power plants all over the nation again, installing solar panels, installing energy-efficient HVAC, figuring out a way to fix all of these electric motors that are going to start breaking down in the next few years. Who's going to fix all of these really sophisticated equipment that is now in every every hospital? So I think we need more vocational certification that foots to the mainline economy that creates great middle-class jobs and recognizes that a lot of kids just don't want to go to college. They're up for apprenticeships. They're up for training. But we need to stop... Um, I don't know the term is we kind of slander it or we uh, yeah. demonize is the wrong word, but young people say they'd rather be a barista than a welder. A welder makes 90K a year and it's a good job. And I, I also, I have dogs. The example I use is, so I've gotten to know my carpet cleaner guy really well. You know, dogs and carpets do not mix. <laughs> and this guy hey, is there's the There's a carpet. graph right there, Scott. Dogs, yeah. carpets, yeah. Well, especially when you have a Great Dane. I mean, it's just, and, a, and, and she's a puppy. And I, I won't get into details, but she is, it's not a good idea to have carpets. Anyways, uh, so I know this guy is our carpet cleaner. And Started the business. He got, I think, about a month of training from an apprentice at the age of like 50. He was a pilot and he got laid off as, uh, you know, the eighth time that Spirit Airlines or whoever it was, EasyJet, reorganized. Bought a van, got some training, bought a bunch of solutions, and he can get any substance out of any carpet. The guy's a carpet whisperer. And it sounds like a job, but he's out. He's out and about, he's meeting nice people, he's doing interesting things, he's like making people happy. Oh my God, he saved the couch. And I kind of did the math. I think he's pulling down about 250 to 300 gross, and I bet he clears about 180 after he pays for the van, he buys a few Google keywords. And he said, I'm turning away business. So he's thinking about actually, he's bringing his niece into the business, and she's this young, young woman who was in the army two years, didn't have a lot of prospects. She's this you know, young, cool woman, like tiny thing, five foot one, all tatted up. And she's learning how to clean carpets. And I think we need to institutionalize that. I think that we need to 
stop fetishizing the traditional route that we've decided is the way for all young people and celebrate work. One of the things that's wonderful about America is we work. We work really hard. I think there's a lot of dignity in it. I don't know about you. I get my identity from work. I'm not proud of that, but it's the truth. The opportunity to work hard and create economic security, the dignity, I think it's a big part. A big part of mental health is feeling like you have purpose 40, 50, 60 hours a week, especially if you're not the primary caregiver for kids, which can take up a lot of time. But if you aren't charged with that, you know, working and making money just solves a lot of problems. And I know that sounds crass, but that is, you know, work. I I find that if you can give someone a good job that they like and they get good at it and they start making more money and they start getting prestige and they can show up and say, I can get a stain out of anything. There's there's a level of confidence and self-esteem there. Pride. And that's right. And then, you know, who knows? Maybe you're really ambitious and you buy a second van and you hire somebody else. The guy next door is a small business person and owns a car wash and makes millions of dollars. Anyways, I'm, I think we need to institutionalize vocational programs. I think that's a huge opportunity uh, for America. And I think our higher education infrastructure needs to get more involved in it because Right now, we'd rather loan someone $200,000 to get a degree in history from an elite university that they may or may not be able to pay back. So I, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity around vocational certification. I want to transition for my last question from that into just a whole different area, which is where America's headed, because most of your chapters talk about how we're losing the sense of community, the fact that Rotary Clubs are going away, the fact that People are not making more money while the founders make more money. And yet we're idolizing the people that are founding companies. In fact, one of your more bizarre, uh, one of your more bizarre pictures in the book shows the number of times the founders mentioned today versus was mentioned 20 and 30 years ago in, in corporate filings. And all of a sudden now everybody's bragging about who founded the company. At the same time, you also talk about the number of Americans that own a cell phone, 97% versus 92% of all drinking water that meets EPA standards. Just some truly some truly big stats, Scott, that show that our head maybe isn't where it should be. And there might not be the opportunity for everybody that we think that there is. And I'm wondering, with all of social media today, which supposedly helps us get more together. We feel more isolated. You talk about men feeling more isolated. I'm wondering if we've magnified this Horatio Alger American dream thing to the point that we're a okay with cashing in. Like the American dream has kind of gotten away from us to the point that we're, we think, Hey, I just want to be this guy. I don't really care about employees. I don't care about my local community. I just want to be that one rich person. Would you say that that's kind of where you're headed here or, or where we're headed? Yeah, a lot there. So very big picture, broad brush. As a society becomes more educated and wealthy, church attendance and reliance on a super being goes down. But our questions get bigger and bigger. So in that void has slipstreamed tech innovators. Every third year, times person of the year is the richest guy in tech. It's not the most famous doctor. It's not the most famous engineer. It's not the most famous astronaut. It's the wealthiest tech guy. I don't care if it's Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. Every third year, times person of the year, or we decide in America, the person who's the person of the year is whoever's the wealthiest tech person. And it's understandable because we've developed this idolatry of innovators. And the closest thing to God that we have is technology. It's mystical. I have no idea how my iPhone works. I just know it's amazing. And these people are not only geniuses at making this happen, they make billions of dollars. And we have this idolatry of the dollar. So we put these people up on a pedestal. I think I think Steve Jobs is our generation's Jesus Christ. And I think Elon Musk has kind of taken that mantle. And it's unhealthy because they get to live by a different set of standards. They will post our government. They are profane. Uh, and also, I find that the lack of patriotism that they demonstrate infects younger men. And I think it's totally unwarranted and obnoxious. Uh, I I think there's a reason that Elon Musk did not start an EV company in South Africa or that he's not launching rockets from a pad in Montreal. If you look at the Pacific coastline, it's littered up and down California with companies that have created the value of the GDP of a small Central American nation, whether it's Qualcomm in San Diego up to 
uh, El Segundo with SpaceX, Los Angeles or Venice with Snap. You keep going north. You get to, you get to obviously to to Meta, to Google, to Salesforce. And you keep going north. You get to Amazon and Microsoft. And then something happens around the, just above Seattle. It kind of stops. There's Lululemon up in Vancouver, but that's about it. And then when you get to Qualcomm down in La Jolla, again, it stops. And you got to go thousands of miles until you get to Mercado Libre in Buenos Aires. So it's clear there's something about America and specifically the most valuable companies in the world all have one thing in common. They're a layer of genius innovation built on top of investments made by middle class Americans, whether it was DARPA or GPS or the U.S. Post system. And so for these guys to be less fond or less appreciative of America, I find obnoxious. The people who are most patriotic are the ones who have invested most in America, are veterans. And the people who are least patriotic, in my mind, are the ones who have benefited most from America. And that's our tech innovators. So I find it really discouraging that the people that young men model want to say things like, Elon Musk has said, uh, you know, the government just needs to get out of the way. He says that all the time. Should government have gotten out of the way when they lent you $450 million when your company was very, very early? Should we get out of the way in terms of the EV subsidies we're providing? Should we get out of the way in terms of the the charging stations that all taxpayers are paying for right now to make electric vehicles viable? So there's a virus that infects, I consider myself part of the tech community, there's a virus that infects us, and that is we conflate luck with talent. And the smartest thing I ever did was to be born a white heterosexual male in California in 1964. That's the reason I'm here talking to you. I'm remarkably talented. I am not a modest person. I'm in the top 1%. And in this world, that'll put me in a room the size of Germany. And I live a much nicer life than the top 80 million people on this planet. And it's because I was born at the right place in the right time. And I'd like to think that I appreciate that and that I have reverence for our, our if find me someone who's incredibly smart and wildly underpaid, and they usually work for one organization, the US government, find me someone who's wildly overpaid and totally unappreciative, there's your tech executive. And I think they're terrible role models for young men. I think we've lost a lot of connective tissue. We don't respect our institutions. America has never been stronger. Our government has never been, in my view, more important. And it disappoints me that we don't have any connective tissue and we become weird. A third of each party feels that the other party is their enemy. 54% of Democrats are worried about their son or daughter marrying a Republican. What we need to realize is that Americans' best allies will always be other Americans. And I think our idols are telling us otherwise. And then they build companies that pit us against each other, exploit us, addict us. So I think the tech community sort of lost the script, and I think that they believe they're not, I don't believe they're held to the same set of standards as anybody else. I think if, if they found out that this podcast could be directly linked to an increase in teen depression and suicide, you and I would be out of a job. Immediately. And that doesn't seem to be the case, and it's big tech. That was a rant. That was a rant. <laughs> well, well, and I puked out a question, and you puked out an answer. Your yeah. answer was better than my question, though, brother. Uh, the book is Adrift, America in 100 Charts, and you have some big solutions at the end of the book. I was glued from the beginning to the end. Thanks so much for spending some time with our Stacker community, helping us uh, helping us grapple with some of the big questions. Scott, I appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Congratulations on your success. Hey, Nick Loper here from the Side Hustle Show. When I'm not helping people earn money outside of their day job, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to... Professor Galloway. And man, some big discussions about entrepreneurs in America and obviously some heady thoughts. But I want to keep it uh, our discussion here afterwards, OG, with the stuff he talked about that's much closer to home, which is this idea of the trades. I really like this idea. The story told about the carpet cleaner. I think, uh, I think there's a lot there. There's a lot of kids that are going to college that want nothing to do with college and they're going because of this romanticism we have with it. I totally agree with him. There was a period of time where it was nobody went. And then if you didn't go, you weren't going to be anything. And I think we've kind of crested that hill and are on the other side of it now, which is you don't have to anymore. There's lots of great educational opportunities that don't involve going to school. I mean, I thought that I had read this somewhere, but I can't find it. You can practically get all of your coursework done from MIT for free. You just don't get the paper that says that you went to MIT, which is the $200,000 piece of paper. And so if you look at education as 
something to achieve and not necessarily a box to check, and you think about it like lifelong learning, then you, I think you're far better to go into whatever it is that you find interesting, open mind and say like, you know, I just want to learn about this thing. I don't, I don't care necessarily about somebody certifying on a piece of paper that says that I took this certain number of the guy, the, the carpet cleaner guy recruiting his niece, his niece is learning everything about carpet cleaning. She's not paying somebody for all of this education about how these chemicals work, about how the, uh, about how the process works, about how to deal with customers. She's getting paid at the same time she's learning. Yeah. So she's making money versus somebody else who's actually out a bunch of money And she's on this trajectory, if, you know, Professor Galloway's numbers are correct, she's on this trajectory to someday maybe making $300,000 herself. I mean, this all, I mean, look, they're all certifications and it all comes down to the ROI on different certifications. I think that's when, when we all pivoted or a number of people have started to pivot on the value of a university certification. It's just a different kind of certification, right? You get that piece of paper, no different than if you got your... Uh, PMP, Project Management Professional Certification. It's it's just a different kind of certification. But now, in the last 25 years-ish, the one that comes from the university got so expensive that it's becoming harder, more difficult to justify the ROI on it versus the certifications you can get for a lot less while maybe you're also earning money and they have pretty good ROI on them. So I, sure. I think we're all realizing that. Which means the discussion out of high school has got to change because the default discussion at a high school graduation is what college are you going to? That's the default. And when somebody goes, well, I'm not going to college. What's the first thing everybody thinks? Oh, Oh. what's up with you? Whoa, 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 whoa. What happened? (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. Where you think, you know, what uh, Scott's talking about with the trades. I mean- Just Mm -hmm. some fantastic stuff there. And to your point, OG, some of these things that you do can lead to uh, degrees. My daughter, Autumn, is looking at a degree in a field that she doesn't have anything to do with for her bachelor's. And the MIT curriculum that you're talking about, when she talked to people at the master's program that she's hoping to get into, they said taking this MIT course for free would be a great thing on her resume to show them that she's competent and ready for a master's in this program, even though it has nothing to do with what she'd, uh, what she'd done as a bachelor. So looking, well, it's no different than what we were talking about, uh, on Monday about behavioral finance and on the job training is way more, way more important than book training. It's one thing to, you know, (laughs) read the book. It's another thing to have done it. It would be funny if like Doug, like you were saying, it would be funny if, Plumbers and electricians had to go to college in the same manner that marketing professors did, you know, or whatever. It's like, could you imagine like, like having to sit through a class and you graduate with your electrician degree, having never touched electricity, (laughs) you know, having never done a single thing. And it's like, well, but I'm, I've got a degree in electricity. It's like, okay, but have you ever done it <laughs> like like have you ever seen the impact and the benefits of your work and the ever made a mistake that somebody's caught you know that you learned from it's like no but i read yeah, the book. you know 220 221 whatever it takes <laughs> whatever it whatever. takes whatever it takes <laughs> I, I love that i wonder if that movie holds up that's from a great movie called mr mom i don't know if the whole movie does but there are still some great lines in there that you're gonna laugh at regardless of your age uh, clean up in aisle six. We weren't in aisle six. <laughs> yeah. He's trying to take his kid's blanket away. Come on, do it your favor. Next thing you know, you're going to be strung out on comforters. <laughs> Walking the streets. So many, so many good jokes. That was funny. That was back when people thought Michael Keaton was just a comedian, yeah. by the way. You yeah. know, just a comedic actor. And now we see him as such a good dramatic actor. Mm-hmm. By the way, that's what's refreshing, speaking about the marketing professor, to have somebody like uh, Scott Galloway, OG, who's talking about colleges should have some of their certifications taken away, should have their tax-exempt status taken away, and he's he's teaching at NYU while while he's saying that, because he's a guy who's been there. He's a guy who's actually started businesses, and he's like, so much of this crap is BS. It's it's garbage. Uh, Some good stuff. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. I know. And that's why I think uh, so many people like him is because of, as you heard today, man, he calls it the way he sees it. Good way to get credibility. 
kind of like OG. Yeah, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, OG, they put what you value first. My regular uh, breakfast oh, of boy. a banana, two scoops of <laughs> Did protein powder. you think powder. he was going somewhere else with that? When he paused after regular, <laughs> oh, like me too. <laughs> that is <it> just, <laughs> no. I didn't say being regular. <laughs> That's what I'm I. Not as old as you guys. <laughs> I know that's something that you, that both of you guys strive for. Oh boy, uh, it's your loved ones in your time. Yes. Ready for breakfast? Joe's but trying to save this. It's, it's always good when you can be relaxed around your loved ones, <laughs> and you've got plenty of time, if you know what I mean, uh, with them. That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life, guys. You get your life insurance done. Get it done now. You, if you don't have life insurance. And you have people that rely on you for money. What are you waiting for? Because we never know what's coming down the line. And you go to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life. They give you a free quote right away. They've taken all those questions that they already know the answer to. They've gotten rid of those. It's very simple. It's quick. It's online. Their prices are affordable. Better yet, all policies issued by the parent company, Mass Mutual, which is more than 160 years old. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to... Peter? Uh, speaking speaking of Peter, we uh, no, we're not throwing it out to Peter. We only did that once. Probably never throwing out the lifeline to Peter again. And we did have some of our friends in Australia uh, who said, uh, "Just want to let Peter know we don't have five twenty nine plans here." What? And I said, "Well, that's fine because I'm not sure that Peter could find Australia on a map. <laughs> so <laughs> could not find his quote home on a map." For people that missed that episode, uh, you'll have to go back and listen to that later. But for now, we're going to listen to this question, which comes to us from John. Say hi, John. Hi, Joe and OG. My name is John. I'm a longtime fan of the show. But in truth, I learn more from Doug most times than I do from you two. That being said, I have a question about fixed income investments, especially thinking about treasuries versus CDs right now. I've been slowly moving over money that I've invested in CDs to 12-month U.S. Treasuries are paying over 3%. I invest in these through my Fidelity online account, and it's pretty simple. I see there's some broker CDs that are paying about as much, but it seems like Treasuries are a much better way to go because interest rates are just as good or even better than CDs. They are super safe, and I don't have to pay state income tax, which is important because I live in a high income state income tax state. Am I missing something, or are Treasuries just a better way to go now? Thanks, and keep up the good work. Wow, you happy, Doug? Pretty happy. I didn't. He started out rocky. I was a little bit grumpy <laughs> for the first couple, and then he saved it. John, you made a friend. You've you've got a friend in Doug. So, uh, hey, thanks for the call. And by the way, we're getting a little granular here, OG, for a lot of people. But uh, CDs versus Treasuries, man, I don't think he's missing a thing. I think this is when you get past the one hundred one to the two hundred one where maybe you can get just a little haircut more money, maybe eke out a few extra dollars you wouldn't have had. Is, is, is he missing anything? Well, what he's talking about there was brokered CDs versus treasuries. I'm going to assume just so that I don't lose my mind that this money is mostly for emergency fund and um, has nothing to do with long-term investments because under no circumstances should any person with any desire to grow one's wealth, have any long-term money in treasuries, but plus fighting over, uh, so let's just call this cash. Reserve. Yeah. Fighting over 2.8 versus 3.0 for your retirement yeah. is, uh, neither one's going anywhere. That's yeah. It, you, you both under both scenarios, you die broke. So let's assume it's cash. So brokered CDs are, uh, CDs that are usually uh, available on your, uh, brokerage platform, Schwab, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, whatever. And they're kind of like leftovers. That's how I think about them. Banks have written out all of these assumptions that they're going to have for this this pot of money, you know, that they're going to lend this pot of money at this rate. They're going to borrow a pot of money at this rate. And sometimes that doesn't happen. People cancel their CDs early or whatever, and those liabilities kind of still hang on the books. And so you can jump in and get a CD from a couple of years ago that was paying a much higher interest rate but a much shorter term because it's like the back end of somebody's who had to had to walk out of it. They're much less likely to be productive uh, from an interest rate standpoint today than they were, let's say, two years ago because the current interest rate is higher than you know what it was a couple of years ago. So in that scenario, I don't really think that there's probably a lot of value there. 
you know, in the brokered CDs or just regular CDs for that matter. Treasury CDs, both basically backed by the same people. FDIC is the government. Treasuries is the government. So kind of sort of yeah. tomato, tomato as it relates to its uh, security. The liquidity would be one issue. You know, there could be a, a little bit of a liquidity issue on the uh, treasuries, but probably not a ton, if any. And ease of doing business, you know, there's probably some commissions involved in terms of buying the fixed income. So just be aware of those things. And as long as you're using it for cash and not any long-term investments. I, I There's only one other There's only one other thing that I could think of, OG, which is that if he's buying it through a brokerage account, he might be buying the, this treasury on the open market. Make sure that it's at par value because if he's buying it for a different price, a lot of novice bond investors buy bonds based on the yield. And the true yield to maturity is going to be different if you buy it for a price different than par, yeah. which I know just went over a bunch of people's heads, but I don't think it's it's over John's head. So if you're buying it at par, it's going to be the yield to maturity is going to be exactly what the coupon rate is, what it's and why, telling And you. why wouldn't you, to your point, why wouldn't you just buy it on the Treasury Direct I website? don't know why you wouldn't do that. Yeah, just buy it on Treasury Direct, gets rid of all that. Besides the website is probably the worst website the government has. <laughs> That's just, saying something. I don't know that I've... I don't know that I've seen a worse one. Has any, I mean, you guys may not know this, but to log in, you put in your user ID and your password, but your password you have to type using your mouse on their fake keyboard. And it's not case sensitive. Oh. So whatever your password was, you're like, oh, small case, lowercase s, capital P, lowercase q. No, they don't care. Just Just use the mouse thing, and they've got a little fake keyboard like... It is definitely a website from 2004. I, I mean, I can't, I don't think there's been retro. a single update. Deliciously since. retro. <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. Yes. But anyway, so yeah, you, you might as well buy it right from the Treasury Direct website if you can, unless it's a, obviously it's a qualified plan sure. or something. Okay, we can go off of this, but I don't want you to get hammered, OG. There's actually a reason. The reason they're doing that is is not ancient. It actually adds a layer of security. Because there's a lot of malware out there that does key keystroke logging, and when you use a virtual keyboard, <laughs> it is a way to I know get rid of that. So that they're doing that on purpose. It sucks, but they're doing that on purpose. Yeah, no, I know. But there must be a way, and it's old and, and firm because the only company in the unit in the universe that does it is, you know, that I would assume that other people would do it if well, it was as secure. Know. There are a lot of, of great security measures that companies can put in place and they choose not to for our ease of use. They've they've decided we're the treasury. We should be really, really secure. So we're going to do this thing that sucks. <laughs> I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying, look, I'm not trying to support it. I just want you to know that's not like an ancient thing. They decided to do that to try to foible or excuse me to what's the right word, not foible to try to fight the keystroke logging Trojan horses that are out there or viruses. Hey, just some uh, final thoughts uh, to put a, pin in this beautiful episode we we had today man we covered a lot of great ground big thanks to everybody who left a review of this podcast mom puts those on the refrigerator brags to her bridge club about all of the stackers out there by the way if you're looking for more surround sound we have a facebook group and to get there easily just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash basement and that will take you to a bunch of uh, like-minded people who are all chatting about uh, things we talk about on the show, dad jokes, and and uh, and more, board games. Am I doing something wrong, Joe? When I go to the basement group, I don't hear a thing. And you always talk about if you want surround sound, go to the basement. And it's very quiet down there. I don't surround, get it. surround writing, <laughs> surround uh, keyboard. I don't know. Uh, if you really want surround sound, I'm going to be this afternoon on Instagram, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. You do the math on where you are uh, here every Wednesday when I'm in the basement and I'm here for another nine weeks, believe it or not, before my next activity, which is crazy considering the year I've had. But uh, last week we had uh, Tara Falcone on from Reason. You can go to stackybenjamins.com slash Reason to check out uh, that app, which, by the way, correlates completely with chapter one of my book stacked. And speaking of that, I give away a book almost every week uh, there. I try to, Doug, replicate your trivia and I'm nowhere near as good at it as you are. Yeah. But if you're not here for any of that, you're here because of the fact that recession fears for a lot of people ramping up and you might be feeling anxious and you really feel like you need to make some moves in your finances. Here's what I want you to do instead. 
Check out this free guide OG and his team put together that'll help you plan more and panic less, no matter what the market does. Some great insights on what you should be doing, smart questions to ask yourself so that you make financial decisions your future self will thank you for. Not like I've done some mornings where I wake up after a night of social media and go, oh my God, what did I post? <laughs> That's you don't you don't want to do that with your money. Head over to stackybenjamins.com slash guide to get that free guide from OG. Stackybenjamins.com slash guide. I like how you try to blame that on social media and not the wine. <laughs> it might be. You know, uh, Scott Galloway had all those graphs. I think there's a graph there, too. Yeah. Joe posting on social and wine. Like, you can see the intersection after there. After a night yeah. of social and it's media. Not, no, it's after a night of booze. It's, it, it isn't good and uh, definitely a good idea to stay away from the keyboard when you're doing that. All right. Something we don't want to stay away from is lessons for today. Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, take some advice from Professor Scott Galloway. Worried about big picture economics? Vote. But if you're worried about your own ability to make money, grab certifications. Think about where you live and who you work with. Those are huge keys to success. Second, with the Fed moving again, that's yet another reminder to get a debt strategy in place. But the big lesson, if this is the thanks I get, maybe I won't be a good neighbor. I mean, I'm just going to cancel the 45-foot inflatable water slide. It's done. You, you almost had it. I'm canceling it. Thanks to Scott Galloway for joining us today. Find out more about his work at ProfGalloway.com. You'll find his book, Adrift, wherever books are sold. And you know what? I'll also have the team include links in our show notes at StackingBenjamins.com. That's just a little thing I do for you guys. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all The Basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I want to ask you about this, you know, the sharing economy becoming such a thing. I mean, now you can share so many things. We had Craig Curlop on uh, maybe a year and a half ago, who is a guy that for a long time worked for Bigger Pockets. And I remember talking to Josh Dorkin, the creator of Bigger Pockets, a phenomenal real estate community, by the way, for people that don't know Bigger Pockets. 
Josh Dorkin told me that Craig Curlop would rent you his underwear if if somebody yeah. would well, uh, if somebody would I take that it. Phrase. Yeah, yeah. Craig Curlop will rent you whatever. Uh, he has set up curtains made of sheets in his house so that he can subdivide a room three ways and sell it to three people versus one. Like that's what he'll do. But but is this a bridge too far? Chicago Tribune has this piece. Uh, this is written by Christopher Borelli. Swimply. Have you guys heard of Swimply? Have not. Swimply's like Airbnb for renting strangers' backyard swimming pools. We tried it. Oh, yeah, I've heard of this. Was it weird? He writes. Was it sanitary? <laughs> We've grown comfortable with our so called sharing economy. We forget that Airbnb offers us a stranger's bed for the night or longer. Uber puts us in a stranger's car. Those are just the ubiquitous ones. Peer space gets you a stranger's backyard, barn, or basketball court for a bridal shower, birthday party, or a bat mitzvah. Outdoorsy alone, you a stranger's RV. Sniff spot caters to dog owners in need of fenced in lawn for off the leash time. Just park, rent your parking space. Get my boat? Well, that's self explanatory. Then he says there's Swimply, which feels different. It's not really different, it just feels different. The best way I can explain it, having used the app recently for the first time, legitimize pool hopping. As a kid, my friends and I would climb neighbors' fences and spend an anxious 15 or 20 minutes luxuriating quietly in a stranger's pool, trespassing benignly until a porch light popped on and we'd scramble off like 16 year old cockroaches. I love Chris is writing here, but now you do it. Now you do it. And you tell the homeowner, Hey, I'm going to come over. I'm going to use your swimming pool. And guys, the homeowner's home, like the homeowner sitting there looking out their back window while you and your buddies are out there, you know, uh, making memories in somebody else's pool. What's the problem? I don't know. Would you do that? You have a swimming pool. OG. Sounds good to me. Would you, would you rent out your swimming pool? I don't have a problem with it. I, I don't know that I Seems like a lot of work, but would you make them take a shower first before they got in your pool, like at public pools? It's, it's full of chemicals. Like that's that always cracks me up. It's like make sure you take a shower before you get in the uh, community center pool. It's like <laughs> you know much you know much chlorine is in there. Like there's whatever you're washing off is going to be plenty washed I mean, I'd, off. I'd like to think that's true, but then they always talk about you know when they do uh, bacteria samples or whatever from hot tubs. And it's just uh, yeah. disgusting. So is that just the it, okay. heat that's so, causing that? Because there's a lot of chlorine in hot tubs. Probably. But my point is, is what is the outdoor shower doing? Like, it's just getting you wet. Like, nobody's in there, like, undressing and scrubbing off. Like, there's not, like, a loofah in there. It's just, oh, like, standard to this. do that? <laughs> you might. The EPA has ordered me to do that repeatedly. <laughs> By the way... Joe, that is not at all what I thought Sniff Spot was. I mean, I've never been to that site, but Sniff Spot. <laughs> and I'm out. I'm out. Oh, oh, I'm, out. I'm glad that, that there was an explainer there because I mean, I've heard about it. Oh. oh. They decided to do that to try to foible, or excuse me, to what's the right word? Not foible, to try to fight the keystroke logging Trojan horses that are out there or viruses. None of this needs to get included. Steve can strike all of this. I just didn't want OG to get crushed by some of the techie people we have. I know what it's for. I'm not an idiot. Mostly. I forget. <laughs> you were telling me all the time. I'm you're the smartest person I know. So I forgot. <laughs> it's very true. He literally does Joe. <laughs> Which is, it's again, a factual statement. Kind of factual it's just, statement. A, it's not, it's not hyperbole. It's, I can't help it if I'm beautiful. It is what it is. I can't, I help, can't it help that. If I have a beautiful mind. <laughs> it's what it is. I'm your Huckleberry. Watched Tombstone last night. It was fantastic. Such a great, it is great. Movie. Actually, my favorite line from that movie is, uh, and he's on the train platform and he says, uh, and hell's coming with me. Do you not remember that? Yeah, I, I saw that movie so long ago. Isn't it, are we talking about the old Tombstone movie, like with, 19, uh, with Russell, nineties? Kurt Russell, Kurt Russell, and yeah, 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 yeah. Bill Pullman, good stuff. But I don't remember any of that Val movie, Kilmer. man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all star lineup. I don't remember any of it. I just remember liking it. Uh, what's what's the other one, Doug? I watched with you, Three Ten to Yuma. Oh, it's such a good movie. The new one. That's yeah. a remake of an old, you know, classic old yes. Russian, but the new one. Yeah, the Russell Crowe one. Yeah, the Russell Crowe one I think is better. That's a really good movie.
fun. Yeah, like I remember action. I came over to your house with some beer and you're like, tonight we're watching 310 to Yuma. I'm like, well, okay then. <laughs> so, we, so then get under the blankets and right. snuggle. Yes. Damn it. I know. I know. I don't know why I had to watch it on your lap, but <laughs> I guess that's the way you do it. <laughs> 